trying to find him here. Just the video. Huh? Just the rest. Okay. Uh, right. So, uh, my name is Brian Dublin. Thanks very much for coming. I know some of you are here. Anyway, for Damien's class, um, it's uh, nice to see, you know, a few people here. It's a little bit intimidating. Some of my colleagues are here. Wasn't expecting that. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so what I'm going to talk to you this evening is um, about this project that I've sort of been working on for, uh, you know, most of the last five years or so, but really going back to, you know, a project that I started when I was an undergraduate here, which would be all the way back in 1990. And that project is called Tune Pal, and it's all to do with annotating recordings of traditional Irish music, and it's a kind of a digital libraries project, if you like, uh, but it's a music library. And... Uh, so this, the reason why you're sort of part of this innovation festival, the focus of this festival is about sort of research projects that have become commercial and uh, you know sort of grown out of academic sphere and become sort of products and things that people use. And TunePal very much fits that bill because you know TunePal is kind of used by about five or six thousand users around the world now, and uh, you know it's it's become very much a part of how people play traditional Irish music nowadays. So. I'll um, just tell you a little bit about myself. I've been lecturing in the DIT since 2002, but I have a kind of a longer history going back to, like I said, the early 90s when I was an undergraduate student here. Um, when I was a young boy, I like to, I like to always start talk, you know, start a talk going all the way back to the beginning. When I was a little boy, I had two big interests in life. And number one was playing the tin whistle, and I used to do lots of you know competitions and Kelly bands and stuff like that. But the other thing I was always really interested in was uh, computers and technology and things like that. So I was a big fan of Six Million Dollar Man when I was a kid, uh, really interested in robots and spaceships and all that kind of stuff. And luckily when I was about mm, 12 years old, my dad bought me one of these, it's called an MSX computer. And this is really where I learned my programming. And I would probably think I learned more about programming from just you know typing in little computer programs into this thing than I ever did in my years of college. But certainly they put the foundation on me. So. Um, you know, one thing I, I think about programming is programming is just such an enabler for so many of your ideas. That if you can program, you, you can do so many different incredible things. Um, and I, I suppose the really, the really the way I was able to achieve this whole TunePal project is because I, I started programming so young. And now I just think programming is the best thing. Everyone should learn to program from a very early age, right? And it's just such an important thing. Anyway, just um, before we get into the, the details and the demos and stuff, what exactly is TunePal? Well, I can probably safely say it is the uh, the world's leading search engine for traditional Irish music. Um, there are a couple of other websites which do kind of similar things, but they don't have what I have, which is basically query by play. TunePal allows you to play a tune and identify a tune a little bit in a way, you know, you might have heard of the Shazam technology. It's a little bit similar to how Sh Shazam, um, people compare it to Shazam. But actually, how it works is quite different because TunePal uses melodic similarity, so it's really for live music rather than for recordings of music. Uh, it's available on iOS, Android, iPad, and also online through the web browser through, the, through tunepal.org. It supports title searches, so you can search for a tune by just typing in the title of the tune, and it will search through, you know, the 17,000 tunes in the database at the moment uh, from loads of different collections, you know, including classics from the world of traditional music like uh, the Kilbrick and Harem books and O'Neill's Music of Ireland, but also kind of modern collections like the session.org and there's a guy called Heinrich Norbeck who collected about 2,000 traditional tunes in the late 1990s. And these are kind of the definitive modern collections of traditional music. Um, there are, I would think, about 5,000 mobile users of TunePal at the moment, and it grows at a rate of about 200 new, uh, users per month. And okay, that's not quite in the same category as Facebook or Foursquare or any of these things, but this is Irish trad we're talking about here, right? Um, it's a different, different marketplace. It's not a mass market thing, it's a niche product, you know, that suits uh, people that play and listen to Irish traditional music. So, the fact is, almost everybody that plays, in traditional, uh, plays traditional Irish music has heard of this. You know, it's been, it's been really widely spoken about in the media, and, you know, even though I've never done any advertising up until quite recently, you know, just word of mouth, you see it everywhere you go in trad sessions, and I've been in trad sessions and played in Spain, and played in the States, and everywhere you go, I see people with their mobile phones out using true tube pop. Um, this is where traditional music is typically played in the modern setting, you know. Um, it's played in trad sessions. How many people here have ever been to a trad session? How many people play trad? Ah, oh, good man, I see a couple of 
couple of my mates up there will have to get you for a few tunes at some stage. Um, so this is where I play. One of the great things about traditional music, you know, and I guess people that sing in choirs and people that do marching bands and stuff get that same sense of community. But I think one of the things that, that's unique about the trad world is just general informality when people meet up and play together. So this is a session that I play every Friday lunchtime in the Madonna's pub very close to here. Well, I, I've walked into sessions in, in the States, you know, in 11th Street Bar and not known anybody. Uh, and just maybe I found the information about this session on, on a website called thesession.org. You go in and you can just sit down and you can start playing with people, so long as you play at a certain level. It's quite, it's quite remarkable. I think. It's, a really great, um, it's a really great social thing, you know. And this is you know, one, of the, one of the main reasons why I enjoy the trad scene so much. It's just I've made so many friends and I know I can travel anywhere and play. Um, traditional music, the way it sort of fits into the tune pile picture, is mostly dance music. So it's mostly what you call, um, it's periodic, you know, it's in a particular time signature. Um, it has this kind of monophonic, well it has this kind of re repetitious conversational quality. People that play try to understand this, you know, you listen to a tune and typically the tunes have an A part and a B part. Um, they're monophonic, they're dance music. One reason why I think Tune Pal has been possible is because most of the composers for the tunes that people play are long dead and long forgotten. And, you know, I would say for about 80% of tunes that people play in sessions, nobody knows who composed them. They were composed hundreds of years ago. Uh, you know, uh, so there's no copyright issue, for the most part, on traditional tunes. So that's another reason why I'm able to do this uh, for trad and maybe not for, you know, Beatles melodies or whatever. Um, the melodies are quite simple in a lot of ways, you know, certainly compared to something like a Bach chorale. They're monophonic. They um, have this, like I say, two parts, you know, there's 64 notes typically in the A part of a jig, for example, there's not a huge amount of notes in them, right? So to make the tunes interesting, people articulate them with what's called ornamentation. So they put in variations, put in all this sort of fingered ornamentation to make the tunes interesting and to add expressiveness. Um, there is actually a large corpus of tunes, you know, there's about 8,000 unique tunes in existence. Um, and then the other thing that characterizes traditional music is the instruments that's used to play traditional music. So typically the illum pipes, the flute, the fiddle, concertina, baron, banjo, uh, a few other instruments, you know, but that's pretty much it. You rarely hear or you should never hear traditional music played on a, con uh, played on a say, a, you know, a saxophone or a trumpet, right? There's a certain sort of range of instruments that people play trot on and that's it. Um, and it's mostly for listening to nowadays, right? Um, and also people play for social purposes as well. Uh, whereas most of the tunes were originally composed for dancing, nowadays people play them for pleasure, people play to listen. Um, so because there's this big corpus of tunes, and I meant to put a slide up about the famine, you know, and the famine is one of the reasons why there is such a big uh, diaspora of musicians around the world, and why our traditional music is such a big global phenomenon. It's because, you know, so many people emigrated from the country in the 19th century, to the States, to, to, uh, to the UK, and all over Europe, and Australia. And that's, so that's why there are these big sort of communities of Irish musicians around the world. Um, the actual tunes that people play, you know, like I said, they're all hundreds of years old, but over the centuries there have been a very sort of significant number of people that collected tunes. You know, so there's, um, in particular, I just put up a few of them there, you know, there's, there's Francis O'Neill who collected, who's a police chief in the um, Chicago Police Force, and they called him Chief O'Neill. So he collected uh, 1,001 tunes, you know, published them in this book called O'Neill's 1,001. That was published in 1905. Right, there were other sort of very famous collectors. I just put up there, because I had a very interesting talk last week about uh, Goodman. That's Canon Goodman's book up, da up there. So Canon Goodman was a <coughs> professor in Trinity in the 19th century. And he collected a lot of tunes in the maybe from about the age of, from, from about 19, uh, sorry, 1860 onwards. And one of his sort of main motivations was the fact that, you know, this was after the famine. And there was a very great sense that the tunes were just going to be lost. <coughs> the musicians had all died or emigrated. But in actual fact, um, quite the opposite happened. You know, because of all the emigration, the Irish traditional music really flourished, you know. Um, so that's, you know, they're sort of the old collections of traditional music. Um, in the modern age, you know, obviously we're in the internet age now, right? So around about... In 1991-92, there's a guy called Chris Walshaw in the UK um, who invented this markup language for 
uh, music score, it's called ABC. And there's lots of music score notation systems. One is called Music XML, for example, but this one was really simple. And this is just an example of a tune in ABC. Um, so the, the tunes typically have all of these headers, and then there's this body section for a tune. These are ASCII files, basically. So, you know, the header section has stuff like the tune title, the key signature, the source for the tune, the discography, you know, um, various sort of bibliographic pieces of information. And this is actually the score that's written out in ASCII. And a whole lot of really brilliant tools have been invented to convert from this format, say, to MIDI and convert it to state notation. So you can render them in the, this classic sort of five line state notation. But you can see you've got D, B, G, you know, and these letters correspond to the actual musical notes. And then you've got a pipe symbol here, which represents a bar division, a tilde there, which represents an ornament that you play on the notes. And, uh, you know, happily, there's, there's fantastic collections of tunes now available in ABC, including all of the classic ones, you know, including stuff like O'Neill's 1001 and O'Neill's uh, collection of 1,850 tunes, um, the Kjolrik and the Heron series of books published in the 20th century, and they're all available in this ABC language. And this is just one of the tools that you can use to manipulate ABC. It's called ABC Navigator. And you can see that's the ABC up there. It's converted to a score here. You can play it back. You can speed it up and slow it down. So there's a kind of a, a good amount of work being done in you know, using ABC for various purposes. So actually, way back in 1993, this is when I started thinking about you know, combining my sort of two great interests, one, one being the music and the other being computer science. Uh, I had a great final year project supervisor, right, who still lectures here in DIT, a guy called Mark Deegan. And Mark Deegan really encouraged me to try and come up with a project that combined music and um, computer science. And so the first ever project that I did in this area was I scanned pages from O'Neill's books, because they weren't available electronically at the time. It's very interesting because we didn't even have a scanner in DIT in those days. I had to go to Trinity to make use of their scanner. It was a monochrome flatbed scanner, and I scanned these images from Anil's books, and I wrote some software then that could actually convert it to my own little Marco bike, which was no internet, so I wasn't familiar with ABC at that stage. So I invented my own little music notation language. And uh, you know, most of this talk is hopefully going to be demo, so I'm going to give you a little demo of this project. Uh, it still works, and I still have it. And This is the first ever kind of tune palette like project, right? So, what you can do here is you can enter a file name. Let me pick number three, for example. So, it loads up the file. And what it does is it does OCR on this. I love demoing this. You know, when I was a student here, I never really got the time to show this off, but now I can show it off. You know, it's 20 years later. Um, it scans it up and it does various different uh, image processing algorithms, image mapping and density mapping in various ways to try and figure out what notes are in the actual. Uh, printed score. So it does a perimeter trace and then some density maps and things and you know plots all of these lovely graphs. Picked a rather complicated one so this might take a little while. So it's doing the second piece of music, doing all these various different things. Eventually you end up with a set of notes and you can play it. bonus marks for any of the tribe musicians you could recognize that one. Rather small section, right? So maybe it's not a, not a great one to pick. Um, so that was my first, that was the first tune pal. Um, so then I ended up getting a job in the computer industry. Um, I worked initially for a company called Survey Instrument Services, and, and this is what kind of got me into doing things for handheld computers, because uh, Survey Instrument Services uh, used to sell these things. They're called Scions. I guess everybody's heard of a Scion, have you? You heard of one? Okay, this is called the Scion Series 5. And this, uh, about 15 years ago, was a state-of-the-art pocket computer. Um, so the very first version of the actual product that I called TunePal actually ran on one of these. And what it was, 
was a thing that allowed you to load up ABC files and you could search through them. It used to be able to store about 5,000 tunes on it. And you could search through them and uh, play back the tunes and various things like that. So, you know, that was the first tune pop. And uh, then eventually I got a job working for a company called Bear Sterns. Have you heard of those guys? Anyone heard of them? So Bear Sterns is an investment bank, right? And you might know that this was... Um, you know, around about the sort of late 1990s when companies were just hiring people whether they needed them or not. So I found myself working for Bear Stearns Bank, getting paid quite a lot of money, but without really a lot to do. So I decided I would write the second version of TunePal, which was TunePal for Windows Mobile Devices. So again, it's the same sort of idea. No internet connection or anything. All the tunes stored on the actual device. And then finally, I uh, eventually got laid off from Bear Stearns, thankfully. Uh, one of the best things that ever happened to me really was getting laid off. And eventually I ended up lecturing here at DIT. And in about 2005, I started doing a part-time PhD. And my initial um, sort of title for this was all about modeling creativity in traditional music. I wanted to keep up the idea of working in the music area and trying to bring computer science and music together. So what I was trying to do, I published a couple of papers in this area, you know, but I, I wasn't really sold on the idea. It was all to do with sort of trying to model what a human does when they interpret a piece of music, you know, putting in the ornamentation, uh, doing machine learning, and um, I developed a system with one of my students that could actually compose new tunes. And uh, I, think I'll, I think I have one here that I could play for you, if you're interested. So yeah, this is one of the computer composed tunes. You could actually click a button and it would pop a new tune. It was, it was kind of awesome, you know? But most of the tunes, they weren't terribly good. Um, they sounded very much like they were composed by a human. Well, this is one of them here.
discovered this sort of useful sort of thing, you know. And uh, this is what Matt looks like, you know. Uh, I, I developed this then for my for my PhD thesis, and I made a lot of different sort of contributions. But the first sort of you know thing that I developed in the music recognition area looked like this, and I also plotted a lot of graphs and stuff based on you know how it was analysing the audio and extracting information from the signal, and then doing the matching. And basically, how it worked was, you know, a lot of this technology was around already, but just not brought together in the sort of the whole package, if you like, you know. So the transcription, if anybody knows anything about how digital audio works, um, the audio is sampled. So I sample the audio at CD quality, which is 44 kilohertz. And then I run an algorithm called an onset detection uh, algorithm on it. And the onset detection figures out when each note changes, you know, when one note changes from, from one note to the next. And uh, then I did a thing called a pitch detection. Anyone knows anything about music, you know, the, the sound that you hear and what distinguishes one sound of a note from, say, an A from a B is the pitch, it's the frequency, you know. So I incorporated pitch detection and eventually I was able to get out a string of ABC notes. The actual matching was achieved using an algorithm called the edit distance algorithm. So I take a transcription of what the user's played, and I take one of the music scores, and I calculate how many changes it would take to make what the user's played into the music score. So how many edits you have to make. And, uh, I basically then, you know, do that for a thousand tunes and I rank them all in order of descending edit distance. And then the one who's, which is the closest and requires the least amount of edits, I say that's most probably the tune that the person <coughs> played. And it turns out that, that is a very effective way of, of actually doing the matching. And this algorithm is still at the core of all the tune piles and it gets executed hundreds of times a day. Every time somebody does a search, it does an edit distance calculation against what the users played versus 17,000 scores and then ranks them. And then that's what the user gets back. So I suppose I made a number of contributions. The thing actually worked, you know, amazingly. And it worked with a, a sort of success rate of about 92%. I also developed another algorithm called Tansy, which was uh, basically an algorithm for being able to take a big, long recording of lots of tunes and separate it out into separate tunes. So I was able to figure out where one tune ended and the next tune started. And for all of these experiments, I used a 1,500 tune corpus. And I also developed this algorithm called the Ornamentation Filtering Algorithm, which again, all the tune files kind of still use. So this was my PhD, and I did lots of stats as well as part of the PhD to basically, you know, establish whether the algorithm was working or not, and obviously I just decided that I did, I was getting a success rate of 92%. Why I called my algorithms Matt and Tansy, uh, Dave, do you want to tell them? Yeah, well, that first one up in the top left hand corner, Matt Malloy, yeah. very well known flute player, and the second one is same as Tansy, another very well known That's right, player. yeah. So I suppose these would be both kind of heroes of mine in the music area, you know? And uh, people that I would obviously aspire to, you know, to try and learn their style. Uh, and that's why I named my algorithms after them. So Matt is Matt and Lloyd, and Tansy is James Tansy. So um, I finished my PhD in about the summer of uh, 2009. So it took me about four, let's see, I started in 2005. It took me about four years to get the whole thing written up and to do the vibe and everything. But immediately I finished my PhD, I thought, well, a lot of PhDs basically go nowhere. But people do them, and then maybe they get, you know, a couple of papers out of them, and they just go and sit on the shelf, and no one ever does anything about them. But I kind of realized I had done something which was quite useful. This is the kind of thing I would have used a lot myself. And so immediately I set about making this available to people, you know, on a true website. And so I launched this website in July in 2009, and this is the first version of TunePath. And so what I did is kind of separate it into different components that I developed. And I put a Java applet here, which did all the transcription and the recording. And then I put together a server, which was based on PHP, MySQL, and also JSP. So the actual matching algorithm happens in Java because PHP is too slow to do that kind of processing, right? And so the matching happens on the server. And, and it worked, you know? So people started using it and talking about it. And then I just promoted it on a few tribal music websites. And then people started using it. And that was great. Um, that's what TunePod looked like when it launched, and this is what it looks like now. So, you know, towards the end of 2010, I got a grant from the Department of Culture, Sports, and Tourism. Uh, I got all of the art assets and got the website redone, you know, basically put everything on a professional footing. Around about this time last year, when I gave a, a talk about this, you know, we, we did all of this work basically to kind of, you know, put the whole project on a professional footing. <laughs> so I got logos done and flyers and my banner and all that stuff done as well. So that's what TunePal looks like now. Um, I'll give you a demo of it, right? Um, the 
show you the kind of functionality that you can do with the TunePal website. So this is TunePal, right? You go onto TunePal.org and this is available for free. Anyone can use TunePal.org, right? I'm going to play a tune into it and see if I can get TunePal to identify it. So how it works is you just click the record button. string of notes, right? So this uh, string of notes is what tune pal has thought you played and then you click search. So I know that tune is a Josie McDermott tune. It's, I think it's called, uh, do you know what it's called Shane? Ah, there you go. It's called Father of Grady's Trip to Baca. Okay, so tune pal tells you the name of it. And what you get when you when you do a tune pal search like that is you get all the tunes in, in descending order. So it'll give you the top 10 matches. So because tune pal has so many different collections of tunes in there, usually the first few tunes are the correct ones. So there's Father O'Grady's Trip to Bacca. It tells you that it's with 75% confidence. So you can click on the tune. It gives you the tune. There's loads of features I've added this year. For example, there's no uh, comments here, but I've actually added Facebook comments and things. So you can put comments in against the tunes. And what you can do then is you can click on the MIDI there. And uh, the MIDI loads up, I guess, in a separate tab. Somewhere or other. Also get a view of that's the tune in ABC format. You can get a view in stave notation as well. So that's the stave notation for the tune. <coughs> uh, you can also get the discography for the tune. So I actually did a bit of web mining to, to enable this functionality. Um, it actually goes out and searches the internet to find out what CD recordings have that tune on it. And of course you can put Facebook comments in there as well. You can also do a YouTube search. The YouTube search is quite cool because once you find a tune, there you go, you can click on it in YouTube and you can hear somebody else playing. That's Mark Zomoraku, another very famous flute player. do an Amazon music search as well. So if you want to buy the, the a CD recording of that, you can do an Amazon music search. I'll open the tune and you there. And you can do an Amazon music search. You no, it didn't find out. Uh, I mean, that's the core functionality of the of the TunePal website. You know, and that, that, that's basically just taking the Mac 2 product that I developed and I kind of web enabled it. You can also do titles, uh, you know, title searches. So you could do, uh, it's called Grey. Do a title search as well, and it will search them all by title, you know. So um, that was the first version. A lot of the functionality hasn't changed significantly since the very first version, but obviously it's much more professional, like I hope, and a bit more professionally put together. So where are we here in our presentation? Let's go back into here. So um, that was doing pretty well, and then I decided the best thing to do was, uh, you know, because most people. Uh, most people don't have a laptop in trad sessions, right? Most people have a smartphone. So I decided to make a smartphone version of it. So the first smartphone version I made was for iPhone, the most popular uh, sort of mobile phone platform. And that launched in January 2010, so the start of last year. <coughs> Sorry, February 2010. And uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about how much I would charge for it. So initially I was going to give it away for free because I gave away the website version for free. And mostly I was just interested to see if I could capture some stats and, and whatever, you know, to see if I could write some papers in. But, but I sort of talked to a lot of people and <clears throat> I decided I would charge as much as I thought I could get away with, just for the hell of it. <laughs> and I reckon the appropriate price for it would be maybe the price of a single pint of Guinness. So I picked the price of $5, you know, and that's roughly uh, €3.99 when you do the, the, the price tiering in, in Apple. And, and I'm kind of glad in retrospect that I, I did actually decide to charge for it rather than give it away for nothing. Because even a small 
you know, a mouth like that, when you multiply it by the hundreds of people that actually buy it every month, it is added up to, you know, it's a few quid. I have a lot of ongoing costs, right? Uh, trust me. You know, it doesn't all just go into paying for my social life and stuff. Um, you know, I have to keep the server up and running. I'm about to pay 3,000 quid for a new flute and stuff. Are you playing with TunePal there? If you're using TunePal, that's okay. If not, you got to hang up your phone, right? Um, yeah, are you buying it? <laughs> uh, okay, well, anyway, that's that's what I charge for it. And it, it kind of adds up a bit, you know? Um, like I said, I do spend a lot of money on, on the instruments and things, so... Um, yeah, I also have increased the amount of tunes in TunePal. So there's now 17,000 tunes, and you can get access to them all on a mobile device, right? So how does the mobile versions of TunePal work? Um, so there's basically native iPhone and Android clients. The iPhone one is written in Objective-C. The Android version of TunePal shares some of its source code with the uh, uh, iPhone version. Some of the actual transcription algorithms are written in C++. <coughs> I use a couple of open source library, and I also bought a commercial license for a product called FMOD, which is a, a library that allows you to play MIDI files on, on an iPhone. Um, I use the Android native development kit, and uh, all the searches actually happen on the server, so the transcriptions happen on the devices. Even with a sort of something like an iPad, it's still not powerful enough to search through all 17,000 tunes, because it doesn't do a straightforward search. It has to do this edit distance search, which is quite a complicated algorithm. And it's quite CPU intensive, so it has to happen on the server in the cloud. The iPad can't do it. You know, at one stage I did some testing with the iPhone, and it was taking a minute and a half to search 1,500 tunes. So, you know, this, this is the only strategy that would work. The server is all written in MySQL, Apache, and Tomcat. So obviously it doesn't work unless you have an internet connection, right? So what I'll do now is maybe give you a look at the iPad version of TunePal. So the iPad version of TunePal was sort of the last version, full version that I launched, and this was launched in December 2010, so the end of last year was the first version of TunePal for iPad. So, you know, maybe I can quit out of it there, it doesn't really matter. You see basically what, you know, what, what happens when you launch the app here is, uh, you know, it just brings you straight into the record screen, right? Other things that you can do here, you can do a title search. So if you go onto the uh, titles there, you can type in the name of a tune. Any tune, Shane? Mary Blacksmith. The Mary Blacksmith, right? B-L-A-C-K-S. So it'll do B-L-A-C-K-S. I'm actually connecting to the internet via my mobile phone, so hopefully this is going to work okay. So there you go. There's Blacksmith. Blacksmith, Blacksmith. Lots of Blacksmith. The Mary Blacksmith. So you tap on a tune. This is kind of like tunes in the cloud, if you like, right? Because none of these are stored on the device at this stage. And the tunes are all downloaded on demand. <coughs> it downloads them as ABC and then it can render them as music scores. And the iPad, as you can see, is a really great device for running TunePal on because you know you can rotate it, you can zoom in the score like this. Uh, from here you can do lots of things like you can play it back, right? Uh, what else can you do here? You can do all the stuff like the YouTube searches, you can post it to Facebook. You know, you can share it on loads of different services like uh, Twitter and Facebook and things like that, so you can tweak the tune. Um, one thing that people quite like using this software for is learning, you know, so you can actually slow it down and you can transpose it, for example, up three semitones, and you can even change the instrument, you know, so you can play it back with a harpsichord, for example, and then it goes and regenerates the tune, you know, so it plays it back like that. That's quite slow. I'm going to just change the transposition back to be zero semitones. So there you go. It does lots of things like that. You can also store tunes on your device. So you click add to my tunes and then it adds it. <coughs> and uh, then you can go back into my tunes and you've got the list of all the tunes that you, you searched for. So that's kind of the core functionality. It's about searching for and downloading tunes, music scores. Again, it's kind of aimed at, at musicians rather than, you know, um, sort of just people that are interested in Irish music. Um, one of the great things that mobile devices have nowadays is GPS. Most of them have GPSs built into them. So, you know, one of the options, you can turn this off at TunePal, right? It's, it's not a compulsory setting, but you can anonymously submit the tunes that you searched for to the TunePal website. And it's interesting, because about 70% of the queries that come through to TunePal.org are geotagged. In other words, they come with the person's latitude and longitude. And because they're geotagged, you know, you can do all kinds of amazing things. For example, on the devices themselves, you can just show a map and say, yeah, this is where you were when you searched for all of those tunes. 
So here we are in Kevin Street. So this thing has picked up our location in Kevin Street. And we've got a little dot on the map. Uh, and this is us here in Kevin Street, right? Just the GPS on the device, you know, or the location functionality there. You should be able to tap on the tune. There's the Mary Blacksmith. That's the tune that we just searched for. Um, what's also kind of interesting for me, from a research perspective, again, all of this is anonymous. So I don't know who's doing what, but every time somebody searches for a tune using TunePal, it comes through to the TunePal website. And then I've sort of written some, oh, here we go, it's already here. I've written some little mashups, basically Google Maps mashups. So you can plot where people are when they're, when they're actually making use of tunes. So this mashup here basically shows the last 2,000 uh, searches that were made using iPhone, by iPhone users around the world. So, you know, you can quite clearly see the number one source of tunes is, where would you think? Yeah. Ireland. Where would you think is the number two source of tunes? It's, it's the states, right? So the number two sources of tunes is the states. But what you can do is you can actually tap on these guys and you can see what was the tune that the person actually searched for. There's a tune that's quite art. And then you can jump in, view the tune. You can also see stuff like uh, 78 mobile downloads. So this is a popular tune. One of the things you can do here in this um, Zeitgeist link is, and, and I thought this would be more useful than it actually was, you know, but it's, it's uh, I do this every year around Christmas time, I show the top sort of you know 100 tunes that have been downloaded from TunePal in the last year. And I don't aggregate them. I, I kind of I've, I've separated them here as to basically iPhone and Android and and, uh, and that you know. But, but when I do the top 100 every year, I, I do them just. These are the mobile downloaded tunes. The Cash Jig, you know, the Cash Jig. It's kind of one of those starter tunes that every traditional musician plays. So I wouldn't think this is the tune being played in sessions up and down the country or around the world. I would think this is probably the tune that people get tune pal and they go, oh, what tune will I play? I want to play the Kesh Jig, and they try it out. So that's why I think it's the most popular one there, you know. But most of these, yeah, the Silver Spear. I mean, again, if you look at them, and most traditional music musicians would look at these and know, yeah, these are common tunes. The Dublin Reel, the Green Mountain, uh, the Bag of Spuds, you know, these are all common tunes. There's a weird tune. I don't know how that's, I don't play that tune. Paddy in the Punjab. Now, I did do a bit of research to see, was that just an anomaly? You know, was it something weird in the tune that was getting thrown up even when people don't search it? But it turns out it isn't. And apparently, this is a very popular tune in Scotland. A lot of people play this tune, Paddy and the Punjab. Um, so, they're all real, you know? Mostly. Sometimes I have to do a little bit of filtering. Because sometimes there are tunes that pop up, you know, quite often it's the wrong tune. Uh, so, that's the TuneBall mobile app, and that's the geocoding. Yeah, so TunePal has now got users in 29 different countries. I actually did this little reverse geocoding. What I did was I took the latitudes and longitudes there around about uh, January for a paper that I was writing. Uh, I reverse geocoded them so I could figure out the country and the region where the person is. You can reverse geocode right down to the address, but obviously it's really, really inaccurate, you know, because the geocoding that you typically get is to the nearest 50 or 500 meters. So, you know, you get an address, but it's just a ballpark. You'll get the city and that, you know. But it turns out there's users of Chimpal in 29 countries. Um, just some analytics that I did. I just actually knocked these ones up today, right? There's been 89,000 music searches since I launched the very first version of Chimpal in January 2000. When did I say I launched it? 2009? Yeah. Uh, January 2010 or February 2010 was the first app. Sorry, July of 2009 was the first version of TunePal, the web version. And since I launched it, you know, nearly 90,000 actual people have played a tune into TunePal and retrieved a tune using it. Uh, 43,500 of those through the website TunePal.org. 22,000 Android searches. The Android version launched in July 2010. Mm. Yeah, July 2010, yeah. Um, I forgot to put the I.O. Oh, sorry, that's, you know, so you can see in total there's, that's uh, 89,000 iPhone ones, you know. So the iPhone is by far the most popular way that people use Tupac. Um I think, yeah, what's that, you know, in total you can see there's about 150,000 music searches. Again, this isn't, you know, Google. I guess Google gets this number of searches probably every couple of minutes. This is, uh, this is a pretty specialist thing, you know, for, for folk music scores. Um, I just did a quick search. This year there's an average of 330 uh, music searches. These are again people that play a tune into one of the apps or the website and actually find a tune using it. Uh, and an average of 232 title searches per day. So that adds up pretty quickly. Um, 
Again, I did a quick search to see how many scores have been downloaded through QPAL. 17,000 scores have been downloaded from, you know, onto iPhones, iPads, Android devices around the world. There are about 6,000 users of QPAL at the moment. And, uh, yeah, I did the average one, yeah. And about 200, that 200 is wrong. That 200 should be per month. It's not 200 downloads per day, it's 200 per month, right? Um, you know, it gives me great satisfaction, and I earn, obviously, a hell of a lot more money out of being a lecturer in DIT, but the money that I earn from selling tune piles gives me, I'd say, 10 times more satisfaction than my salary that I get every month, because I know that I earned that myself. This is my idea. I did it. You know, I put it together from scratch from the very first idea, so I'm really proud of the fact that, you know, whatever revenue I earn goes kind of back into my, my career as a part-time musician, part-time programmer, you know. Um, this is just another kind of stat that I did about JunePal. And what I did was I uh, reverse geocoded all the queries from Ireland, by, and I did them by uh, time of day. I also did them by county. You know, you can do them by county as well. Obviously Dublin being number one. Number two, what would you think? Galway. Huh? Galway, Galway would be up there in the top three, and number three then? Or Clare, maybe. Would be Clare, exactly. Galway, Dublin, and Clare, the top three counties in Ireland. For, and they, these are places where trad music is biggest, you know. I'm sure you get loads from Calvin, huh? But... I, I haven't got the stats here, I have it in my paper, you know. Um, I did a quick sort of survey by time of day, and I found this very revealing. It actually just, again, supported, you know, my estimation of how people use and where people use the app. And you can see that, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, 5 a.m., there's very few queries. 6 a.m., very few queries coming in. A couple of people obviously do practicing first thing in the morning here. And uh, you can see then about lunchtime, 1 o'clock, a lot of people taking out their instruments and offices and whatever around the world, a bit of a peak there, <laughs> comes all the way down here, and then what's happening here, do you think? Yeah. People are going out to pubs to play trad music, and between sort of 9 o'clock and about, uh, you know, 1 o'clock in the morning, that's when the majority of, of sessions come in. I think this is interesting as well, this peak here between 9 and 10, you know, this is when people are, are starting to into the session, and maybe they're more inclined to listen to, you know, to tunes and try and identify them. I would say after a little while, people just say, okay. I'll just play the tunes that I know, and they, they don't bother querying them as much. You know, they just let it go, because they're, they're still there in the session. And then, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning, there's still some hangers on there. It's great sessions. About 4 o'clock in the morning, then, dropped off, you know. So, uh, that's how people use TunePal. Um, yeah, so TunePal, one of the sort of reasons why I think it's become quite popular is because I've been able to sort of exploit the media very effectively and I think anyone that's doing any kind of software project or app or anything, this is really important. And I never paid for any of this, you know, I basically just uh, pestered journalists to write about TunePal, including Carla Lillington, who's a great friend of the School of Computing here. She did a fabulous article there last summer, which really put the project on the map, you know. Uh, it's also been in the Irish Daily Mail, the Sunday Times, Top 20 Cultural Apps. Uh, it's been in Fleet Show, which is an Irish language. App. And after Carl Lillington, Lillington's article in um, the Irish Times, it was in the top 25 grossing apps on iTunes last summer for two days. So, um, and then the top five, 50 grossing apps for a week after Carl Lillington's article. It also got thanked on CDs, which was really nice. And that's the thing from the Sunday Times. I don't know, won a couple of prizes as well, which is kind of cool, including the DIT Best Overall Invention last summer. And uh, this is, I'll just show you this, it only takes a couple of seconds. This is from John Creedon's FLA program. So I guess, uh, Shane, you probably watch this regularly. And Dave. Yeah. This was John Creedon's FLA program from last summer. Food to eat. So I just went up to him and said, look, you have to do something about Tupac. It's great. Everybody's using it. And I kind of made him do a little uh, thing about it. If you're a music lover, there is a more like a bit of help. Tupac is the best rapper in the world. Tupac is the best rapper in the world. Tupac is the For many of us who are happy to play along to session tunes but can never put a name on them, help is at hand. Technology in the guise of TunePal will name the tune for us. TunePal has got a database of about 13,000 tunes and you can identify a tune either by if you type in the name of the tune or alternatively you can play a 12 second extract from the tune and a TunePal will go and find the closest match for that tune that you played. Can we try it? Yeah, let's try it. So uh, 
Tunepile is now submitting it to the database at tunepile.org to try and find the fastest match. And it's found that tune as being the, the title is The Man of Iron. Correct. So it's actually found two versions of The Man of Iron. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll go into one of them and it can play back the tune. You can also retrieve the stave notation for the tune. You can add it to my tune so that it actually gets stored on your device and you can find it then again at a later time. Wow. Mind you, this next reel is easily identified. It's Dr. Gilbert's and it's... Uh, yeah, I just briefly mentioned I got a nice grant last year for the Department of Culture, Sports and Tourism. It was a really fluky grant. Uh, this was in the dying days of the Fianna Fáil government. <laughs> and they introduced this grant scheme uh, where you could apply for, for grants. They gave you no criteria, just apply see what happens. So I put in a grant for 30,000 euro for about five months of work to do kind of Tune Pal Phase 2, uh, to get all the art assets and make the iPad version. And they came back and they said, yeah, you can have your 30 grand, but you have to do all the work in 10 weeks. So I ended up hiring loads of people, including Jamie Osler here, who redeveloped the Tune Pal applet, and a graphic designer, and about five or six other uh, developers, you know, to work on various aspects of the project. And we did actually complete all of the work, and we had a launch in the Cobalt Cafe there in um, December of last year, it was brilliant. Uh, it's kind of hard to say, you know, what the biggest benefit for me of doing the Tune Pal project is. Like, one of the nice things for me now is I'm like, kind of wildly famous every time I go to trad sessions, including I was in, like I said, I was in New York this year. Uh, they were promoting some festival, and I said, Would you mind if I put some of my Tune Pal flyers out? And they said, Oh, you're the guy that made Tune Pal. Oh my god, I got it on my phone, it's great. Oh, everybody's using it. <laughs> so, you're, I'm kind of mildly famous for making this Tune Pal app. You know, unfortunately, I've been playing the flute all my life. But I'm not famous for playing the flute. I'm famous for being a computer programmer, you know? I uh, wish I was famous for being the flute, but uh, I'm not good enough, unfortunately. But uh, even though I do enjoy that greatly. But um, lots of people use it all around the world and send me emails and nice feedback all the time. So whenever I'm depressed, or whenever things aren't going out for me, or I have a class that doesn't work out quite well, I just go onto my TunePal website, onto the Facebook page, and I read some of the comments, and that always cheers me up. So in the future, um, this year has been kind of quieter than last year. Last year I had my grant and I had the new versions of TunePal and the official launch and lots of work. So I've had a couple of releases of the new versions of the apps to do things like offline searches. So if you're in a place, for example, that has poor internet connection, uh, instead of just you know giving you an error, TunePal actually just stores the little tag of what you've played so you can submit it later. Like Shazam does that as well. You can't get a, a network connection. So I added that functionality. I've uh, also added you know an extra... I think maybe two or three thousand tunes to the database from different sources, but no really major work on TunePal. Um, but lots of ideas. Unfortunately, you know, we're public servants here. We all have uh, the Crow Park Agreement. I don't know if you've heard of that. <laughs> you probably think of our lecturers just sit around all day doing things like this. But we have an extra three hours on our time time. So I have four subjects that I'm teaching this semester. So unfortunately, my, my time is really limited. And I, I can't I don't have time to devote to this project any more than I'd love to, because I have loads of ideas. And my number one big idea, and I've worked a lot with the Irish Traditional Music Archive, and with Nepi Yellen and with Coltus. Coltus have a fabulous archive called the Coltus, called the Coltus Archive. It's an archive of recordings. They can't, you know, it's basically title searches. They have no query by playing search for that archive. Also, places like the Irish Traditional Music Archive have all of the collections, you know, from hundreds of years ago, in electronic format. Um, available on their website and I really love to spend the time to be able to put all of that those collections together and make them searchable and, and sort of unify the archive you know um, I was struck when I was at that kind of Goodman talk like Hannah Goodman did all this work 100 years ago and you know he really did a lot of good work for the preservation and dissemination of traditional music and I feel that this project has got great potential to you know to move it to the next phase but unfortunately I don't have time at the moment so if any rich entrepreneurs out there wants to pay my salary for a year I can promise you that the trad musicians of the future will, will thank you. <laughs> Maybe I can get something from the Arts Council or something like that. Anyway, my conclusions. Uh, you know, mobile technology is really the right platform to do this kind of stuff. You know, I think the TunePal project is having a really significant impact on how people turn, learn tunes and acquire repertoire. Um, uh, making apps is great fun. Lots of nice things will happen to you. That's the most important message you have. And uh, if you do have a hobby of some form, you know, I'd encourage you to try and make a software project out of it. Uh, it has really been just great fun for me. Well, that kind of wraps up my, my tune pod demo, so... <coughs> any questions?
just just to add to it, Brian. Actually, I've been I was at a session recently, and I was watching an old lady in her seventies on a mobile phone, mm. and she was playing her tin whistle into it to find out the name of a tune that that's she was great. she was after getting from somebody. Yeah. Now, the, the, in addition to that, actually, what was interesting was that she had bought the mobile phone specifically so that she could actually use cool. tune pad. Yeah, I've heard I've heard you know, stories like that. Fair bit, yeah. It's uh, it's one of those killer apps if you're playing trad. So you know, I was at the Tune Trad Festival, and there was these kids uh, at the Tune Trad Festival, and uh, they were busking, and lo and behold, they all had Tune Ball on their phones. So it was great. Well done. Thank you, Dave. Me, hey, you guys want to ask a question? Um, could you link to uh, the song in iTunes? Yeah, I've done it. Um, the iOS apps, if you, it, it has the discographies as well. So if you find a tune in TunePal, you can actually link through to iTunes and purchase it. Um, it involves setting up a thing called the referrals, the iTunes referrals. And they're actually quite hard to set up. And you need to make a contract with Apple to get the commissions and stuff like Shazam has done. And I never bothered doing that. So I just send the referral and, uh, you know, that's it. Apple gets the money if somebody buys a track using TunePal. The thing is, it, 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 it would be a fair bit of work to set it up, but I don't know, would it be actually <coughs> worth my while to do it? Um, I, I think you'd have to be probably selling a lot of music to make any money out of it, but it would be a fair bit of work to actually set it up and do all the contracts and stuff. So in, um, in the, developing the algorithms to actually recognise the tune <coughs> and the music, yeah. um, the, the recognising of the waveforms and that kind of mm. stuff, uh, would that have brought you close to the whole area of the, the current vogue of, of uh, musical compression or sound compression that's behind them these reasons that we are made and what have you because that to me is one of the best developments that have been in recent times it's opened up so many things mm -hmm. so have you sort of been brought into that realm of the compression algorithms yeah it is I mean that, that whole space is called digital signal processing mm -hmm. and there's a, a, a lot of standard algorithms you know we don't teach it in the school of computing but they do teach it in the engineering school but we'll do one of the algorithms that I use we'll do the edit distance algorithm in the second semester but uh, it's, that whole area is called DSP, and it's really fascinating because you're talking about essentially analog information that gets digitized, and then how do you extract any meaning out of it? That's basically what it's all about. Because, you know, if you, if you think of how audio is sampled, for every second of audio, you get 44,000 numbers. And, uh, you know, being able to pro process that in some meaningful <coughs> ways is the big challenge of digital signal processing. You know, because you can't deal with, like, 12 seconds is 12 multiplied by 44,000. How the hell do you... You get any meaning out of that? How do you take that and make a tune out of it? You know, that's the challenge of DSP. It's a very, very interesting area in, I suppose, engineering rather than computer science. <coughs> the whole sort of psychoacoustic analysis exactly. takes out yeah. significant bits and yeah. dumps the rest and has less information. Yeah, definitely. One of the algorithms in TunePal, actually, the pitch detection algorithm, looks for the most prominent harmonic sound. So one of the reasons why it's quite good for being able to extract um, tunes from trad sessions and when there's a lot of background noise and stuff is because it actually is. Uh, able to figure out, you know, what's the most prominent um, harmonic, you know, the thing that's actually periodic or harmonic, which would typically be an instrument, you know, so if there's foot taps and background sounds and all that, it's able to filter all of that out pretty effectively. But would a wind instrument like a flute, or that, would that be the best type in terms of a note to work on? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it works better with what we call legato style instruments. So the flute, the concertina, the accordion, the illum pipes, um, any instruments like that, it doesn't work quite as well with plucked string instruments like the banjo and the guitar, but it does work. Um, it's just the transcription is not as effective, so you tend to get lower confidence scores. It uh, works actually pretty well with the guitar, less well with the banjo for some reason. But I haven't the time to, to analyse it. I guess it's the plucked strings, the, the envelope, the shape of the, the sound, it doesn't work so well with. Yeah? Have you been surprised by any of the ways that people have used it? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. Yeah, it turns out there's a thing called the Tune Pal game, which somebody <laughs> told me once, right? Um, I was given some leaflets into a music shop, and they told me that they play this thing called the Tune Pal game. And the Tune Pal game, what they what group, group of musicians get drunk, right? <laughs> and they basically pick a common tune like the Mountain Road, and they all try and play it on the tin whistle into Tune Pal and see who can get the highest confidence score. That's <laughs> <laughs> called the Tune Pal game. So that's, I suppose, a bit of uh, unexpected. Way that people actually make use of it. I, I wonder is that where the six, the six a.m. <laughs> 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 so, imagine so, imagine so, when it searches, I might find the same tune being searched for over and over again. How did you figure out the accuracy? Um, By surveys or? No, I did it all. What's the word? What's
what's the word? Can you do an experiment? Okay. Make it up. No. Empirically. <laughs> Empirically. I did it all empirically. So for the PhD stuff, you have to be very rigorous. I mean, I guess the same for any of you guys that are doing master's projects as well. You have to be pretty rigorous if you do any surveys or experiments or report them. So I had um, 130 pieces of music, which I hand annotated with the correct titles. Um, and then I ran them through three different algorithms. My own algorithm and then two variations of the algorithm which are common in what's called the literature, you know, which other people have used to do the same job, and I was able to prove that my one was uh, able to give better accuracy rates, so that's how I did it. Yeah? Um, what happens when you have different uh, tunes at the same time played? Does, does it pick one out and then uh, identify from the one tune, or like different instruments playing different tunes? Yeah. Um, it, in, in trial it doesn't happen, that's the, another interesting thing. So this one, this particular set of algorithms that I developed wouldn't work very effectively for stuff like a Bach chorale, where you have maybe five parts playing at the same time and they're all playing different melodies, called counterpoint, right? It works really well for monophonic trial. And even if you have 10 people in the session and they're, they're pretty much all playing the same tune, they might have different variations in ornamentation, but like about 80 to 90% of what they're playing is the same. So it works fine. Um, so long as you hold it up close to the melody instruments rather than the guitar, because the guitar is playing the chords, or if you've got a piano, the piano might be playing what's called, doing what's called vamping, so it's kind of like chords. But typically all the instruments are playing the same melody, so it works really well. In fact, that it, it makes it work even better, because it just increases the harmonic, the amplitude of the harmonic sound, so it works fine in that situation. And a lot of my test audio was from pubs and from concerts and things like that, so. Another question, sorry. If the instrument isn't in tune, would it still pick it up? Yep. Um, so it tolerates like um, a quarter tone above and a quarter tone below the frequencies. So if the instrument is more than a quarter tone out of tune, you might be in trouble. But, um, but if you're a rubbish player. Yeah, it's great. No problem at all. Because it does the edit distance, it gives you confidence scores. You know, you can pretty much completely mash up a tune. But so long as you play some bit of that tune correctly, you'll get a closer match for that tune than any other tune in the database. So you don't have to be in any way a good player. And it works really well for, you know, say older musicians, younger musicians who are learners or, you know, who are maybe not quite as dexterous in their old age and just generally people that are bad. It works fine. No problem at all. I've often been amazed. Like, I, I you know, I play something, make loads of mistakes and still gets the right tune. Almost always. Can budging composers used to see if someone if someone else has already composed or they just composed. Uh, I use that my, I use that for for, for that purpose myself because I do compose tunes as well. And I always play them into tune pods, make sure that it's not just a tune that I sort of learned somewhere, you know, or that it's not too close to something that already exists. So you can definitely use it for that purpose. Yeah. In a more way that it would sort of show 